Well, as we now have 38 participants and counting, I think we'll start uh, today's talk with welcoming you to our sixth Zoom talk this year. Personally, I've always been somewhat skeptical of the multiverse idea, which has been around a while, but recently there has been mention of it again in popular scientific articles. So I thought it was time to obtain an updated and possibly dispassionate view of the subject. What better then than to have the erudition of Emeritus Professor Bernard Carr of Queen Mary University, London, who commands oversight not only of cosmology and astrophysics, but also of the anthropic principle with its own challenges. Further details were posted on the web, which I hope you've all seen. I'm very pleased, therefore, to welcome him at this friend's talk, speaking at the frontiers of science and philosophy to help us understand a difficult and possibly to some a disturbing concept. Professor Carr will speak for about 50 minutes and then take questions. You do not have to wait until the end of the talk to pose your question as we shall be monitoring the posts throughout. So just use the Q&A function. Professor Carr, over to you. Thank you, Marcus. So I'm now going to share my screen. So hopefully everybody can see it now. So my title is The Multiverse and the Limits of Science. And I want to not only describe what the concept of the multiverse is, but, but also focus on the issue of, of whether it really is science or philosophy. Marcus expressed a certain scepticism about the idea, which is a scepticism scared by, shared by many people. But, but I, I'm going to argue strongly in favour of the multiverse, but point out that the real issue is whether it's science or philosophy. So let me just um, summarise to begin with what the main messages of my talk are going to be, just in case I don't get to the end. The first part of the talk will be rather historical and emphasizing that what we call the universe is always growing. The second message will be that the observable universe, that's to say the, the region from which light can have reached us since the Big Bang, is just a minuscule part of a larger physical reality, a concept which is itself um, somewhat mind blowing. The third message is that both cosmology and particle physics suggest that there could be many other universes. And that, of course, is what the term multiverse means. The multiverse says that our universe is just one of many. The fourth message is that the multiverse naturally explains uh, what are called the fine tunings between the physical constants. And those are fine tunings sometimes called anthropic, although that's not a popular word in some quarters, um, which are required to have observers in the universe. And I'm going to argue that, in fact, the multiverse is the most natural explanation of, of those fine tunings. But then the, the last message I want to get across, as indicated by my title, is that when you address the question of whether this is science or philosophy, it all hinges on what you mean by science. And then the nature of science, legitimate science itself, is always changing. So that's the, the message on which I'll end. Now, um, I have to say that about uh, 12 years ago, um, I edited a book called Universe or Multiverse. And I think I gave a talk to the RAS on that occasion. Um, and uh, I, I was quite pleased with this book in the sense that I thought it was very impartial. It, it took people who were pro-multiverse and anti-multiverse. It had uh, mainly physicists, particle physicists and cosmologists, but also philosophers. So I thought it was quite a good overview of the subject, a fairly balanced view. Even though I have to say, I am, I am I would say, an advocate of the multiverse. That's what we'll see. But not, you know, I try to be impartial, as Marcus said. Um, but maybe the key point, I'll just read it out here. Recent developments in cosmology and particle 
physics suggests that our universe, rather than being unique, could just be one of many universes. Since the physical constants can be different in other universes, the fine tunings which appear necessary for the emergence of life may be explained. And so I'm in this talk, I'm going to be making a link between the, uni the multiverse and, and the fine tunings. Now, um, I want to start off then giving a rather um, historical perspective of cosmology, showing how what we our view of the universe has, has constantly evolved. And if we go back to the, um, the ancient Greeks, if we go back, for example, to Plato in 400 BC, they, of course, had the geocentric view where the Earth was the center of the universe and, uh, and the, the stars were, were sort of fixed at great distances. And, and so this is a slightly more technical picture on the right where we've got the Earth in the middle, we've got the, the planets um, moving around the Earth, and then you've got the fixed stars at great distances and 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 the idea of course was that the stars couldn't change that was the if you like the aristotelian view well that view um was d demolished by tycho bra who was the famous astronomer and one day he was taking a walk and in the evening and he noticed the bright light in the sky and this was the supernova in cassiopeia well, he observed this, and obviously it was unusual, but what was really surprising was that he noticed that over the course of the year, it didn't change its position. And that implied it had to be a great distance, because of course by parallax, if it, it, it would have to move if in the course of the year, and unless it's a great distance, if it's a great distance, you can't possibly notice the motion. And so the fact that it didn't change its position made him realize that actually something in the heavens, in the stars, was, was changing. Now that was impossible. So most people said this can't be true because we've been told by the Greeks that, that the heavens cannot change. And he was so annoyed by this that he, uh, he, he said, um, O crassa ingenia, O Ocus coily spectoris. I can't read the end of my line, but what that means is, oh, thick wits, oh, blind watchers of the sky. And the reason he said that was simply because um, people were not believing the evidence of their eyes because it went against what was the tradition. And so I'm going to draw a few lessons here. The first lesson is theoretical prejudices should not blind one to the evidence. And I, this is all going to relate to the question of, you know, what is the nature of science? And I'm going to suggest that if there is evidence for a multiverse, it will be to do with the fine tunings. So in some sense, that is demolished the view that the heavens cannot change. But then, of course, the more important change came with Copernicus when he realized that, in fact, the Earth goes around the sun and not the sun around the Earth. And that was the heliocentric view. Here's one of my favorite pictures of um, Copernicus in, in conversation with, with God. Um, so one realized, therefore, that, that the, at that point, the, the universe was essentially the solar system. Now, people were aware that the stars were there. Galileo had, had used his telescope to look at stars, and he realized that stars weren't inside the galaxy. But there was a general feeling that the domain of the stars would never be part of science because you simply couldn't get observation or evidence. And this was a famous statement from Auguste Comte, who was a philosopher. He says, never by any means will we be able to study their chemical compositions. The field of positive philosophy lies entirely within the solar system, the study of the universe being inaccessible in any possible science. So he wasn't saying stars don't exist. He was just saying this cannot be part of science. Well, Shortly after he said that, um, we had spectroscopy, which enabled us, the discovery of spectroscopy, of course, did enable us to study the composition of stars and thereby extend the domain of science. So there's another lesson to be drawn here. New observational developments are hard to anticipate, and this indeed happens throughout the history of astronomy. So you should never be too confident when you say science can't deal with something, because you don't know what observations around the corner. 
Um, we then, by the end of the 19th century, we, we had the galactocentric view, which said that the universe wasn't the solar system, but the galaxy. Um, I mean, even Galileo knew that well, there were lots of stars. I mean, and uh, we, we knew about there were, he knew there was the Milky Way, which is that band of light in the sky and associated with that with millions of stars of which our sun was just one. But nevertheless, um, at the beginning of the 20th century, the view still was that the galaxy was all there was. The, the universe was the galaxy. And for example, if you go back to the beginning, you have the captain model, which actually more or less had the size of the galaxy correct, but it did put our solar system in the center. So there was still this um, tendency to think we were a center as much as possible. Um, a more modern view, of course, is that the, the galaxy is a disk, but the sun is not at the center. It's about eight kiloparsecs from the, from the middle, which I'm sure everybody is now aware of. But the, the point was that it was still thought um, at the turn of the 20th century, well, no, the turn of the 19th, 20th century turn, that the galaxy was the universe. Um, and indeed, the idea of something being outside the universe was very unpopular in some quarters. Ernest Rutherford, who um, was at the head of the Cavendish, he said, don't let me hear anyone using the word universe in my department because he regarded it as philosophy, because there was no, no evidence that there was anything outside the galaxy. Although actually some people had speculated on that, Kant, the philosopher, thought there might be island universes, island galaxies outside our galaxy. But it was only a minority view. But then there was a famous debate um, in the 1921 as to whether there was anything outside our galaxy, the Milky Way. And this was a debate between Shapley, who believed that it was unlikely that anything was outside the galaxy. They could see the nebulae, but they, he thought they were simply in the galaxy, like little solar systems. On the other hand, Heber Curtis, he argued the group, he argued the case that there were what he called island universes, in other words, other galaxies outside our own galaxy. Now that debate was inconclusive. However, um, just a few years later, Edwin Hubble resolved the debate when he was able to measure the distance to our Andromeda, M31, our nearest neighbour, um, using Cepheid variables. Their periodicity tells you how bright they are. And he was able to establish that they were indeed, it, the, this galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, was indeed outside our own galaxy. And that was a hugely important development because it meant our universe was not the galaxy, it went beyond it. And then shortly after that, of course, he, he started looking at other galaxies and he, he found, as I'm sure most people in the audience know, that most galaxies are receding with it, from us with a speed proportional to their distance. The, the speed is measured by the redshift and the distance by, by the luminosity. And that was towards the end of the 1920s. And he discovered the famous Hubble law, which is that proportion. This is his original diagram. So you we're plotting the velocity on, on the y axis versus the distance. And you can see that it's a relatively straight line, though with a lot of scatter. But notice he's only looking out to something like a million parsecs or, or well, two million uh, parsecs. So a relatively small distance. Um, if you look at a somewhat later Hubble plot, as it's called, it goes out to a much greater distance. This is going out to where the speed of light is something like a tenth the speed of light, going out to 700 megaparsecs. And you should bear in mind that Hubble's data, which I showed in the last diagram, is just this small little square. So in a way, it was amazing that he was actually able to infer his, his law because there was a lot of scatter within a few megaparsecs. But anyway, that is now established, and it's the linear relationship is which is called the Hubble's law. Now, the important thing about this law, remember the velocity is proportional to distance, is that it implies that the if all the galaxies are moving away from us, as you go back in time, they're going to obviously be getting closer and closer. And so you could then infer that at a certain time, all the galaxies are going to merge. And that's what is, is called the Big Bang. And you can measure Hubble's constant, h naught, the constant in this linear relationship between velocity and distance. And the inverse of that is a time scale. 
and it, it's about 13.7 billion years. Actually, it's 13.8 is a little bit out of date now. But that was uh, nice because if you look at the age of the older stars, they're roughly that as well. Obviously, they have to be a little bit less, but they're also roughly like roughly um, 13 billion years. And so now it's it's almost accepted by everybody, nearly everybody in, in cosmology. That the universe did begin with a Big Bang. That's to say a highly compressed state. Doesn't mean we understand what happens, especially not at t equals zero, but we believe it started in a compressed state. And I'll assume that in my talk from now on. And actually, this is was in a sense predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity, which was in in 1916. And it can be visualized. You, you mustn't think of all the galaxies as moving away from us. Um, every galaxy would see the same thing because the idea is space itself is expanding. That was a prediction of Einstein's theory. And for example, you can put um, you imagine the surface of a balloon and you paint the galaxies on the surface and you blow up the balloon and the galaxies get further away. That is the picture that comes from um, general relativity. Space is dynamic, rather hard to envisage, but that was a prediction. Though Einstein himself did not know about the cosmological expansion. Um, he thought the galaxy was the universe. Um, the Russian cosmologist Friedman, he did understand this was a prediction. And in 1922, he wrote a paper even talking about the the evolution of the universe, it, it could either be closed, so-called, and then recollapse, or it might be flat, that refers to its geometrical shape, or it might expand forever. Um, but another person who played a, played a key role in this was George Lemaitre, who was actually a, 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 a Belgian priest and cosmologist. He actually also realized this was a prediction of Einstein's theory. He even, in some sense, predicted Hubble's law and even estimated it. This was in 1927 before Hubble himself. However, his paper wasn't known. It was translated in 1931 into English and the, and the statement about Hubble's law wasn't included ex it, because it was a footnote. But most importantly, in 1932, he realized that the implication of the Big Bang of the Hubble's law was that the universe started in a very compressed state. Um, which he called the primeval atom. And so this was the first idea of the um, of the Big Bang. So here are the galaxies today. As you go back in time, they get closer and closer, and then they merge, as I said, at about 13.8 billion years. And that's that initial Big Bang, which is in some sense associated with a singularity. That just means no physics breaks down. However, it's interesting to see the reactions of his contemporaries. Einstein said, talking of the matrix. He said, your mass is correct, but your physics is abominable. And Eddington, who was another great cosmologist, said, philosophically, the notion of the beginning of the present order of nature is repugnant to me. So although he had this great idea, which we now know was correct, the key people at the time rejected it. Einstein didn't even, he didn't even know the universe was expanding. And, and, uh, Eddington didn't like the idea because he was rather religious and he didn't like the sort of like probably the implication that, you know, that this might do away with God. But anyway, lesson three, don't be deterred by the opposition of great scientists. And you'll find quite a lot of great scientists are opposed to the concept of the multiverse. A lot of them are, are, are not opposed to it, but bear that in mind. It was certainly um, not a popular idea when it was first introduced, it becoming more popular now. Another great triumph of the Big Bang was it explains cosmological nucleosynthesis, which was the generation of light elements um, at a, about a few minutes after the Big Bang. That was a paper written by uh, Alpha and Herman in 1946. But at the time, nobody took it seriously. This is now regarded as one of the great vindications of the Big Bang. It said cosmology was then a skeptically regarded discipline, not worked in by sensible scientists. But the point was, they were just applying known physics of the time, nuclear physics, to the Big Bang model. Um, but people didn't believe them. So lesson four, be prepared to apply known physics in new domains. And all of these lessons are going to be relevant when I come on to talk about the multiverse. As I'm sure you know, in 65, Penzias and Wilson discovered the microwave background. 
that's the a temperature of three degrees it, it it's the same in every direction and and, and basis and that's meant to be a, the relic from the hot early universe um uh, it was then studied in much greater detail uh, the w map satellite um gave us this picture the temperature here the color gives you the temperature so although it's got it's very nearly 2.7 degrees um their little fluctuations about one in a million and, and the color coding tells you what the fluctuations are w map was a satellite the more recent satellite um which europe was involved in was called Planck, and and then you can see um the same color variations uh, but much higher resolution in other words you can see on much smaller scales and I'm sure you've seen pictures like this before. But so at this point, and, and really we're now coming to the turn of the 20th century, we, we've got the, the cosmocentric view, which is summarized rather nicely in this diagram. Um, remember, when you look in astronomy to great distances, you're looking back in time. So when we, we look from the Earth, we see various um, spheres. For example, we, 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 we see galaxies at a certain distance and then eventually we see distances, galaxies at greater and greater distances. Eventually, when we look back to something like a million years after the Big Bang, we're seeing the, the origin of the background radiation, which I talked about. This was gener this last scattered with the matter about a million years after the Big Bang. And so we're really looking back at the universe at this time when it was much smaller. So this is the cosmocentric view. We can put ourselves in the center, but we're not really the center of the universe. It's just that we, anyone can regard themselves at the center, but basically we're looking out to a sphere and that sphere is the, the sort of the furthest we can ever see. So that's the cosmocentric view, which everybody would be fairly happy with. Um, so the first message which comes from this story is that what we call the universe is always growing. And um, so we started off with the geocentric, then we came to the heliocentric, then the galactocentric, and now we're at the cosmocentric view. But then the question is, what happens beyond the observable horizon? Because you see, if the universe began with a Big Bang roughly 10 billion years ago, light can only travel 10 billion light years. So you can never see anything further than roughly 10 billion light years. Actually, it turns out to be bigger than that because the universe is expanding. It's more like 40 billion light years, but at least there's a distance beyond which you can't see. Just like when you're on a, in the ocean, you can't see beyond the horizon. Now, um, so that's the question. What lies beyond the horizon? And then we have some very interesting developments. Um, way back in 1917, when Einstein was thinking about the cosmological implications of general relativity, Remember, he didn't know the universe was expanding. He thought the universe was the galaxy. But he also realized that his equations predicted the expansion of the universe. Um, and he had to stop that. He introduced something called the cosmological constant, which was a term which was a repulsive term, which could counteract the effect, effect of gravity. So he introduced that in order to avoid the expansion of the universe. But then, of course, 12 years later, Hubble discovered the expansion of the universe. And Einstein then said, well, this was my biggest blunder, because if he hadn't made that hypothesis, he could have predicted the expansion of the universe. So he called it his biggest blunder. But then, ironically, in 1998, astronomers found there was a cosmological constant anyway. So you might say his biggest blunder was saying it was a blunder, because in some sense it was one of his most important discoveries. Now. Um, so this was 98. It caused a lot of excitement. This was a picture on the front of Science magazine because the point about the cosmological expansion uh, that it this this cosmological constant is that it generated an expansion of the universe, an accelerating expansion of the universe. The universe ex is expanding, but because of gravity, you would expect it to decelerate so it expands less and less fast. But it actually was turned out to be accelerating and the evidence for this it came from studying supernovae and this is a version of the the Hubble diagram I showed before we've got velocity or redshift on the on the y-axis and the luminosity on the x-axis and it's a little bit complicated but all these lines show you what would happen in different models and the and the and the dots the black dots are the data and what you can see is that the model that works best is really the 
um, the plink one, which uh, or the mauve one, which corresponds to a flat universe, which has got so-called dark energy. This dark energy corresponds to this the cosmological constant. So that was very exciting. The discoverers of that got their Nobel Prize in due course. So what it means is, what is this cosmological constant? It's it's basically a form of dark energy. It's called dark energy. Um, so it's got a, it's got a density, and you might call it the un, the unbearable lightness of nothing. But it's the vacuum, and it's this vacuum energy which is driving the acceleration of the universe. So this is what Einstein originally predicted and then said it can't be right, it must be zero, and that was assumed for many years, but then it was found to be there. And the point is that inflation, the other point I want to make is this same cosmological constant which we've seen today is also thought to have been present in the very early universe when it, uh, it powered what was called inflation. Now, the inflationary theory says that at a very early stage, the universe was expanding exponentially fast. It was expanding anyway, but it went through a very rapid expansion phase. And I don't have time to talk about that in detail now, except to say that that is the model of the early universe that most cosmologists now accept, that it went through this inflationary phase because it solves many problems. And one of the great um, predictions of inflation is that it predicts the temperature fluctuations which we see in the cosmic background radiation. So here you can see uh, the quantum fluctuations. This, the form of this, this is the scale of the universe. So it's 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 expanding exponentially, and it's producing these temperature fluctuations. And what's amazing is that the temperature fluctuations they have a certain dependence on scale. So this is a bit technical. This is temperature versus angular scale, and inflation predicts a particular form for the amount, the amplitude of the temp temperature fluctuation versus the angular scale. And what's remarkable is that the predicted form is it fits exactly with the data. So the data is the red dots and the green line is, is what's predicted by inflation. And when I say inflation, I just don't, I actually mean the model which has got what's called the standard um, Lambda CDM model, which has a cosmological constant um, and also has dark matter. I'm not going to talk about dark matter, but we know the universe. We know that 70% of the universe is in this dark energy and 25% is in the form of dark matter and 5% is in the form of ordinary matter. So this was a great triumph. And uh, I mean, not everyone is convinced of inflation, but naively at least this by measuring this spectrum of fluctuations was in some sense apparently confirming the inflationary prediction. Now, um, and that affects the future of the universe because it means that our universe may carry on, it's accelerating and it may go on expanding forever rather than, for example, recollapsing. And so this gives rise to the sort of history of the universe. You've probably seen pictures like this many times before. The, the, the height, in some sense, gives you the cosmic scale. So we start off at the early stage with inflation. I'm not going to describe all these different stages. Um, helium era is when you have Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Galaxies form here. But the important point is the universe is accelerating again under the effects of a cosmological constant. So it was accelerating at the early stage due to inflation. Then it stops accelerating, but the, then the cosmological constant comes back again and gives us an accelerating phase today. And it's the Big Bang, um, um, is, which is where the very large meets the very small, because obviously when you look to very large distances, you're looking back to very early times. So when you look to something like 10 billion light years, you're looking back to the Big Bang at roughly 10 billion years in the past. And so ironically, the very largest distances correspond to the smaller scales when the universe is scaled. So that's why you have the, the meeting of the Big Bang. And this is, if you like, the, the microscopic domain on the left and the macroscopic domain on, on the right. And this, this picture, of course, is I had in my opening slide. Now, um, so the second message is that the observable unit, well, the point I want to make is that in the inflationary model, um, you predict that our universe is just part of a bubble. And um, and this bubble may itself just be one of many, many other bubbles. And so 
That's why the detection of this cosmological constant was so important. So here's a nice little picture. Um, well, first of all, the message, the observable universe is a minuscule part of a larger physical reality. Here is the picture. Here's one of the bubbles. Our visible universe within our observable horizon is just something like, I say, it says 15 billion light years. It's actually a bit bigger than that, but never mind. But that itself is part of a bubble, and that bubble may itself be part of many other bubbles. So the observer, so that's why I'm saying it's a, we're part, a minuscule part of a larger physical reality, but we can't see it because it's outside the horizon. And actually, what's interesting here is you've got many other bubbles because, in some sense, they could also be many. It's not just saying that there's one bubble, if you like, is one big bang, but there could also be other, many other big bangs as well. But, and of course, they can't be observed either. So that's the second message. Well, actually, um, there are different, many different scenarios for the multiverse. And, and I really just talked about inflation. The picture I've talked about is sometimes called eternal inflation. So the idea is that you've got all these, I won't go into the details of it, it's just because of the cosmological constant dominating at early times, you have inflation, and this gives you lots of little set in bubbles which may be connected or may not be connected, and we're just in one of these, so that's called eternal inflation. But there are other scenarios, for example, another popular idea was that our universe may actually expand and recollapse. And then it bounces and expands again. So you have a so-called cyclic model. And so you can imagine the universe is hand drawn, not very good, but you can imagine the universe goes through cycles of expansion and recollapse. Um, each time the constants may change and, and it may be that uh, every now and then the constants are right for, for us. I haven't talked about the anthropic tuning, tunings yet, but that's one possible um, multi, but these would be a multiverse in time, if you like, whereas this, Inflation was a multiverse in space. You've got more bizarre ideas in, in some models of particle physics as a fifth dimension. We can't see it, but in this fifth dimension, you've got other universes which are called brains, and, and these other universes exist in this fifth dimension, so you, you can't see them. There's even a version, a cyclic model, this is a bit technical, called the ekpyrotic model, in which these brains occasionally collide and, and they go through cycles of collisions which produce produces the Big Bang, in fact, it's a rival to the inflationary theory. But then I, I'll, I'll just say a little bit about um, particle physics, um, because I mainly talked about cosmology. As you know, the point of particle physics is to understand the forces at work in the universe. And there's the electric and magnetic, the weak and the strong force and the gravitational force. And the history of Physics, particle physics, has been a way of understanding that all these forces, although they've got different strengths, can all be unified in some sense. Um, so electric and magnetic are unified as electromagnetic. That's unified with weak to form the electro weak, and then with the strong, uh, not yet tested experimentally, but theoretically well understood, grand unification. And then the final unification is we we unify gravity with the grand, with all these things to form a final theory, which is sometimes called M-theory. And M-theory is meant to be perhaps one candidate for the final theory. Now, I don't have time to talk about this in too much detail, except to say that these unifications happen as you go to higher temperatures. So in some sense, when you look back, I've turned the previous picture uh, from left to right now. So as you go back to the early time, you're going back to early higher temperatures and in some sense probing this. Now, um, and this is sometimes called a theory of everything. Now, I, again, I can't say much about M theory, except to point out this picture comes from, gave the motivation for the cover of, of my book. But the strange feature of M theory is it says there have to be extra dimensions over and above the three dimensions of space and the one dimension of time. And um, of course, in Einstein's theory, you've got four dimensions. Uh, in Kaluza Klein theory, you introduce an extra dimension. You have a five dimensional space to unify gravity and electromagnetism. That idea was in, arose in the 20s, 1920s, but people forgot about it um, until the 80s when we got superstring theory, which said there are 10 dimensions. And then finally, um, the different versions of superstring theory were merged um, 
into M theory in, in an 11 dimensional model. Well, obviously these things are hard to envisage, but I just want to get across the idea that um, there is this link between M, between M theory and the multiverse. Because there are, and it gave rise to what's called the string landscape, which is connected with the fact that you have many different vacuum states. Each of the solutions of M theory corresponds to different possible physics with different values of the cosmological constant and the physic, other physical constants. And this is sometimes called string landscape. Now, this is rather too technical, but for example, um, this is a, a Scientific American article by Busso and Polchinski. What happens with this string landscape is that originally it was hoped that M theory would give us a unique solution. But then it was found if there wasn't a unique solution, there were probably something like 10 to the 500 vacuum states. In other words, 10 to the different, 10 to the 500 solutions with different values of the cosmological constant. And so this was a multiverse too. It was all these different universes, there would be solutions of M theory, but they all have different values of the cosmological constant. So there was a multiverse coming from particle physics. And then people got interested in, in quantum cosmology. I talked about the beginning of the universe being a, a singularity. Well, um, we don't really believe it was a singularity. We, that's in classical physics. We assume that classical physics will be in, replaced by um, some form of quantum cosmology. This is referring, for example, to Stephen Hawking's work. And, um, and so the idea in, in this is that actually Quantum cosmology says you don't have just one universe, you have a sort of superposition of, of universes. Uh, and, uh, and many people argue that's the only way to really understand how the universe begun. And so this is, if you like, a quantum cosmology multiverse. And, uh, and another version of the multiverse comes from ordinary quantum mechanics, not quantum cosmology, just ordinary quantum mechanics. As you know, in quantum mechanics, you, you the wave function is collapsed by the observer and there are many different interpretations of that um, and we don't really know but one interpretation is the so-called many worlds interpretation of Everett which says that every time you make an observation the universe splits and so you get many many copies of the universe but that's another version of the multiverse so what I'm trying to get across here is that the concept of a multiverse arises in many different contexts so when you start talking about is the multiverse real, you have to start saying, well, it depends which version you're talking about. There are many, many different versions of the multiverse. Um, and basically, here's a little slide from Tegmark. There are four different levels of the multiverse. Um, there's the different Hubble volumes, which undoubtedly exist. That just means looking beyond our horizon. There are different inflationary uh, regions, which is uh, the level two, which is, is obviously more speculative, but it does come out of physics. There is the um, the many worlds interpretation, which I've just talked about, um, the, the Everett parallel worlds coming in, in quantum, quantum theory. And you can even just say, well, you could simply have different mathematical laws. After all, where do the laws come from? There could be different laws, with math, different mathematical structures, all of which could give different universes. That's Tegmark's idea. I'm, that To me, that is going beyond the bounds of what is reasonable. But the, those, there are different levels of multiverses, to try, what I'm trying to get across. One is, is def, definitely believable. Two is probably believable. Three is contentious. And four, in my view, is, is probably not believable. Um, so message three, cosmology in particle physics suggests that there could be many other universes. So from cosmology, we've got the cyclic model, inflation, colliding brains, from particle physics, the quantum many worlds, string landscape, and, and quantum cosmology. Now, let me now get on to the anthropic fine tunings. Now, this is um, not, well, let me just start off. There's the anthropocentric view that man is central to the universe. And we saw this, I, this, I showed this in an early slide. Well, we know that's not right anymore. And after Newton came along, we more or less had the sort of mechanistic view that the universe exists independent of our awareness of it. So mind, man and mind, sorry, I, this is a mistake. I should have said human and mind. I, this slide is very old. Okay, human, not man, women as well, um, are irrelevant. And so this is a sort of image of the mechanistic view. Um, 
which says that you know our our presence is more or less irrelevant we might be conscious but we have no effect on the universe you know the laws of physics apply and they don't care whether there are any observers but the anthropic view says some features of the universe are explained in inverted commas by the requirement that life and mind should arise and uh, i'm going to uh, talk about that in other words I, I have a little picture with the eye because it's putting the observer in, in in physics anthropos is the greek word for man or i should say human and um it's a terrible term because it's nothing to do with humans in my view it's really to do with complexity the, the fact that complexity can evolve so the big bang should lead to increasing order and that may culminate in in minds but it's the complexity in my view not the, the humans in other words it's, it's not because of humans, it's, it's because of complexity, in my view. Um, now, there are different sorts of human, uh, of tunings. Um, th there are natural coincidences which have nothing to do with it at all, which just arise because of physics. So, for example, the, the human being is the geometric mean of the, the smaller scale, the Planck scale, and the size of the universe. But that's just predicted by physics. One distinguishes between the weak anthropic principle um, which says that there are selection effects on when and where we observe the universe and and what's called the strong anthropic principle which says the constants themselves are, are, are required by um to, to satisfy certain fine tunings um i'll give you a, a brief example of the weak anthropic principle you could ask the question why is the universe as big as it is it's, i said it's roughly you know 10 billion light years the mechanistic view says, well, the time since the Big Bang is, is 10 to the 10th years. So the size of the universe is 10 to the 10th light years. So there's no particular reason. It just happens to be like that. But Bob Dickey, he gave, who um, also nearly discovered the microwave background, he, he predicted it. He um, and was looking for it experimentally. Bob Dickey said, no, life requires heavy elements and they're made in stars. But stars have to take a certain time before they burn their nuclear fuel and then they explode. And that takes something like 10 to the 10th years. So they couldn't, you need heavy elements for life and they couldn't be any before 10 to the 10th years. On the other hand, if you waited much longer than 10 to the 10th years, that all the generations of stars would have burned out. There wouldn't be life either. So he said life must exist, roughly speaking, when the age of the universe is, is the age of the the main sequence star which is something like 10, 10 to the 10th light years so and so this explains why the age of the universe is 10 to the 10th years it's not saying the universe doesn't exist uh, uh, except at this time it's just saying we wouldn't be aware of it apart from this um, now but that is a weak anthropic principle and i would say that's completely uncontroversial it's merely saying there's a selection effect on when and where we we observe just as there's a spatial selection effect we have to be near a star so this isn't i don't think that's controversial what's controversial is the strong anthropic principle between the coupling constants i mentioned the four forces and they have a they have a strength which is measured by a dimensionless number so um the weakest one of all is gravity and the dimensionless number is 10 to the minus 40 so these are i'm not using many equations here but it's very very small the weak force is 10 to the minus 10 the electric force is 10 to the minus 2 that's sometimes called the fine structure constant 1 over 137 and the strong force is 10 so these are in the order of their strength and the question is will the final theory if there is a final theory explain these values what is interesting is that there are various coincidences which are required for example if there want to be stars and planets alpha g has to be the 20th power of alpha e well that's correct because the 20th power of 10 to the minus 2 is 10 to the minus 40. Uh, if you want to be supernova that's you need the weak force to be balanced because it's the neutrinos flowing out of the star which blow off the envelope that requires that alpha g be the fourth power of alpha w which again it is so these relationships are required for if you need life because both stars and supernova the heavy elements are required for life but the point is they're unexplained and um so there's a, a artist's impression of stars and planets forming and there's a supernova there's another famous triple alpha coincidence which fred hoyle talked about to form carbon you need to have a reaction three alpha particles that's the helium nuclei have to combine 
first to form beryllium and then form carbon. And this has to be made in stars, but it only happens because there's an amazing resonance, uh, which, which wasn't originally uh, known to exist. And Hoyle predicted this on the basis of the fact we needed carbon. And that might be sometimes regarded as an anthropic prediction. And he predicted it, and they went and looked for it at Caltech and they found it. So that's again, but he said, there's no way to explain this. He said, the universe is a, is a put up job. And actually Martin Rees in, in, a, in a book, Six Numbers has, has given six, six fine tunings. Um, I, I'm not going to go through them, but I've just listed them here. They're, they're, one is the cosmological constant, one is the amount of matter in the universe, the number of spatial dimensions even, and the, the fluctuations which are required to make galaxies. Those temperature fluctuations in the microwave background, they are the fluctuations arising from the density fluctuations which eventually make galaxies. But I, I, but then let's just quickly say, well, what are the interpretations of the anthropic principle? Well, if you're a theologian, um, you might just say, well, God created the universe. I mean, here is the, you imagine this is God and there's a space of all the coupling constants. And you just say God created, he put his pin in the right place to allow us to arise. Obviously, that's not very popular. Most physicists don't like that idea. And indeed, when I first wrote on the anthropic principle with Martin Rees way back in the well, 1979, um, there was a huge re antipathy to the idea, I think because people felt it, 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 it smelled of religion, you know, it smelled of God and physicists don't, aren't happy with God by and large. Another view was, well, maybe um, if the consciousness collapses the wave function, this goes back to weed, well, maybe in some sense the universe evolves, produces life, and then once it's produced consciousness, the consciousness looks back on the beginning of the universe, like I've done in this lecture, and brings the universe into creation. Now, that's a, a, a more respectable suggestion, but it's still rather metaphysical, and it depends on the, a minority interpretation of quantum theory that consciousness collapses the wave function. So by far the most natural picture is that the fine tuning results from selection effects in the multiverse. Because if you've got lots and lots of universes in all of which the constants are different as they're likely to be, then uh, in some of those universes, the constants will be as are required for life to arise. And so it's just a necessary selection effect. Okay, so, um, so some physicists like this because it removes the need for God. But I have to say that other physicists um, um, regard the idea um, as, as almost equally metaphysical and, and possibly uh, Marcus, our, our, our host, is in, in that category. So um, it's a contentious issue. But the crucial question is, does the final theory predict the physics, physical constants. And I like this lovely picture of Einstein because he's in a dressing gown and I sometimes like to work in a dressing gown. What really interests me is whether God had any choice in the creation of the world. And, um, and actually, this is a picture from Martin Rees. The key question is, does the final theory, which we don't have yet, determine all the constants uniquely? If it does, then there's no role for the anthropic reasoning because there's no scope for varying the, the, the constants. However, if the constants can vary, um, then you can have different parameters. Um, you can have different universes with different parameters. And then you've got a basis for an anthropically allowed subset of universes. And that's really the key question. Um, now, um, so the fourth message is the multiverse naturally explains the fine tunings. Um, we believe that in the Big Bang, you produce complexity through, you know, in a sequence of events I won't go through now. And in some sense, the, the, or, the production of brains and consciousness, if you like, is, is the culmination of the, the complexity. But the point is the strong anthropic principle just becomes an aspect of the weak anthropic principle if you believe in the multiverse. So you can see from this that I'm already quite in favor of the multiverse, but that's because I take the, the anthropic tuning seriously. I'm not going to talk about the objections. Um, I'm just going to quote three people. The pro view, Freeman Dyson, I do not feel like an alien in this universe. The more I examine the universe and examine the details of its architecture, um, the evidence I find that the universe in some sense, that, that, 
I, I can't read the end of my slide, actually, and my picture's in the way. I find the universe, in some sense, must have known we were coming. So he was a famous physicist. Here's an anti-view, Heinz Padgel. The influence of the anthropic principle on contemporary cosmological models has been sterile. It has explained nothing, and it has even had a negative influence. I would vote for rejecting the anthropic principle as needless clutter in the conceptual repertoire of science. So these are rather extreme views. I always like the view of Brandon Carter, the middle way, who coined the phrase anthropic principle. The anthropic principle is a middle ground between the primitive anthropocentrism of the pre-Copernican age and the equally unjustifiable antithesis that no place or time in the universe can be privileged in any way. And I would say the middle way is in fact the more balanced way of looking at it and has very much been reinforced by the idea of the multiverse. Let me finally end, because I'm already coming to the end of my time, is it part of science? To me, the question is not, do multiverses exist? The question is, are they part of science? Is it physics or is it philosophy? And I've had many debates with this about this with George Ellis, who's a friend of mine, even though he has slightly different views. George says no, he regards it as part of philosophy. The multiverse theory cannot make any testable predictions because it can explain anything at all. What, can one maintain a genuine scientific theory when direct and indirect tests of the theory are impossible? Because the trouble is you can't see these other multiverses. So clearly you, it might seem one's in the domain of philosophy. I take a different view. It, this is coming from a, a paper we wrote together. One needs some degree of falsifiability, but, but the question is how much, how soon? Um, I think it, it may be testable and the theories which predict it may be testable, but we have to wait a long time. Uh, you can't, it might take you a hundred years. And, and then I, I claim the multiverse is part of science if it's predicted by a physical theory. Well, it is predicted by physical theories. I said that. Um, the multiverse is, is, is part of science if predicted by a physical theory. For example, M theory tested. But then the question is, M theory testable? And there's a big debate about whether M theory is physics or just mathematics. Two famous books by not even wrong by Voigt and the trouble with physics by Spodin, who argue that M theory isn't physics, even though it, 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 lots of physicists work on it, some of the biggest brains in the planet. It's controversial whether actually this is proper physics or not. And, and the status of, of multiverse is very similar. Um, now, and it all comes down to what is the nature of science? And the nature of science has always changed. You might say, well, Science involves doing experiments, but that doesn't work in astronomy. You can't do experiments with stars and galaxies. You say, well, at least with a, you've got millions of stars and galaxies to look at. There's only one universe, but we still accept that there's, um, that's part of physics. Cosmology, Big Bang physics is certainly part of physics now. You can say, well, we can't see the other universes, but there are lots of things you can't see in physics. We can't see inside black holes. We can't see quarks, but we believe they exist because the theories which predict them can be tested. Um, and it's true that you will be worried if you can't falsify a theory, but Popper is a bit out of fashion now. So, and I, I argue that actually there may be evidence for the multiverse. You know, we can, we might see collisions of different universes, but I don't have time to go into that now. I just want to end with my final message. This came from Steven Weinberg, who was one of the contributors to my book and sadly died only a few months ago, the nature of legit legitimate science changes. So I'll quote this. We usually mark advances in the history of science by what we learn about nature. But at certain moments, the most important thing is what we learn about science itself. These discoveries lead to changes in how we score our work in what we consider an acceptable theory. And that's really the message on which I went want to end. As I gave the history of cosmology, I pointed out that actually the not only the nature of the universe, but the nature of what we mean by science changes as we get more and more observations. And I've always taken the view that the multiverse is what I call metacosmology in the sense that it's on the border of cosmology and philosophy. But that's because we don't at the moment have the data which could confirm it. I do believe eventually we will get the data. We may get the data, I don't know. And once we have the data, it will become a proper science. So at the moment, it's in a sort of inter a purgatory in between state. I'm going to end with another quote of Weinberg, 
I like. I found a report of a discussion at a conference at Stanford at which Martin Rees said he was sufficiently confident about the multiverse to bet his, logs, his dog's life on it, while Andre Linder said he would bet his own life. As for me, I have just enough confidence about the multiverse to bet the lives of both Andre Linder and Martin Rees's dog. And that's fine. Oh, and by the way, observational proof of the universe. My wife provided me this um, in Japan. I hope you can see this. I'm in a field of flowers and the flowers are called cosmos flowers. And so I thought I would like this because if this, if you like, is the the observational proof that there are many, many cosmoses. That is only a joke. So over to you, Marcus. Thank you very much for your attention. I can't hear you, Marcus. I'm unmuted now, so I should, you should be able to hear me. Um, yes, um, well, thank you very much indeed. I mean, that really covered as much as one possibly could, I think, in the time available. Um, but while you were uh, talking, I just wondered um, whether we are, to some extent, um, along with Candide, who thought we lived in the best of all possible worlds. That's a slightly different question. Um, now, we no, well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Do you want me to comment on it? Well, yes, why not? Before okay. we take, take some I mean, others. I, I mean, I should take the view. The, the anthropic principle isn't necessarily saying we're living in the best of all possible worlds. I mean, for example, and of course, that depends what you mean by the best of all possible worlds. I mean, one question is, if, if it really is true that the universe is fine tuned to make observers, um, how many observers are there? In other words, how many how many planets are there with, with intelligent observers? It's clear that life is rare. OK, mm -hmm. it's clear, I mean, personally, I, I, I bet there is intelligent civilizations elsewhere in the galaxy, but clearly we're rare. It's rare. We know we're, we're the only life in the solar system. So you might say, well, why hasn't the universe made life everywhere? You know, why, why, why isn't every planet got life? Why hasn't every star system got life? And so in that sense, we're clearly, we're not in the universe which maximizes the, the amount of life. We could make, I mean, we, we could make um, life more abundant in some sense. You see, the point is this, the probability, if the probability of life in, in, in a given universe is very low, you know, it might be one in a billion billion or something, that's fine if there are a billion billion universes. OK, because we will necessarily be in one of them. But if, if life were, were too easy to arise, I mean, it, it, you wouldn't need a, a multiverse at all. So we aren't in the best possible universe in the sense that we've got the most abundance of life. But that raises the whole question of, well, is it good that life is rare? Because if life is rare, we, we don't have the opportunity to interact with other, civil, you know, extraterrestrial civilizations and wipe each other out. So it comes down to what you mean by the best of all possible worlds. I certainly don't think we're in the best of all possible worlds. I certainly <laughs> don't think planet Earth is in the best of both possible states. Not at, not at the present time, no. Yeah. Well, let's have a look at some of the uh, questions um first of all came up was is string theory falsifiable well i mean this was the criticism um made by the um the two books i mentioned um and the problem is that to test string theory you have to get to very very high energies that the ultimate aim would be to say that string theory is going to predict all the constants of nature uniquely but it hasn't succeeded in doing that. And as I said, at the moment, it, it predicts, it says there isn't a unique prediction. You've got these 10 to the 500 possible universes. But the problem is you need higher energies to test string theory than are currently accessible by accelerators like CERN. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, CERN, of course, is, is pushing up to higher energies. It's discovered the Higgs particle and things. But it's not only that it hasn't it's not testing M theory, it's not even able to test other less dramatic theories like supersymmetry and things like that, which is, the, you know, a few orders of magnitude higher energy. Um, the, if you want to test uh, M theory, you've got to get up to something like 10 to the 19 GeV, and we're only up to something like 10 to the 4th GeV at the moment. And, and for example, people were thinking one of the predictions of M theory, you've got extra dimensions. So people were hoping to look for extra dimensions in CERN. You can do that only if they're sort of extended. Um, but they haven't got evidence for it yet. I mean, it was conceivable they would have found evidence for extra dimensions, and then it would have been partial 
confirmation of something like M theory, but we don't have that. So at the moment, there isn't empirical evidence for M theory, and that's one of the criticisms. Um, but I mean, who's to say? I mean, if it's true that you have to wait till you get to the Planck energy, the ten to so-called ten to the nineteen GV then we might never be able to test it. And then you've got a real problem about whether you're going to call it philosophy or, or physics. No. Personally, I, I do regard it. I mean, I have partly because I have a big department in my in, in, in my there's a big group in my department who work on string theory. One of my colleagues, Michael Green, was one of the inventors of string theory. And I, I do regard it as physics. And, and people say, well, just after third, because after 30 years, we haven't solved all the problems. It, it's, it's not physics. You know, it's a difficult theory. You might have to wait a hundred years before you can solve all the equations. But are you going to say that because you have to wait a hundred years, it, it counts as philosophy rather than physics? It seems to me rather arbitrary. So yeah. I, I'm hopeful there will eventually be some form of um, empirical evidence for M theory, and just as mm -hmm. I hope there will eventually be some empirical evidence for the multiverse. But okay. the two things are linked. Yeah, thank you. Well, Gordon Bowser uh, asks, in many worlds, when the world split, does each new branch include all the history of the progenitor? And where does all the energy or mass come from for all these new branches? Well, the, the answer for the first to the first question is yes, because in theory, with the multiverse, um, at each time, the full history is contained in in each branch so when you you you're just pushing each history up a little bit and but the history is is not a in this picture the past is not affected only the future is affected although there are other variants actually where you change the past as well but in the simplest um many worlds picture the past is is fixed but um but the future is can can change uh, now, the question of where the energy comes from is that's an interesting question. And, and you could ask the same question. Where does the energy come from in our universe? You know, when the when we created our Big Bang, for example, where does that energy come from? And there, there is one approach to this problem. We said we said, well, there is no energy because in some sense, the energy has, you know, the, there are different forms of energy. The gravitational energy is in some sense negative and um and the rest mass energy is positive and so you you if the universe is closed topologically closed like a sphere there's a sense in which the total energy of the universe is zero so one one view is to say well quantum mechanically you can create something out of the vacuum and you're in if in some sense the it's a closed bubble you're creating, the total energy may be zero. Now that's talking about the origin of our universe, and that's only one particular approach. When you talk about the multiverse, uh, you know, the universe splitting, um, it's an interesting question where the, uh, but you could argue that every branch has zero net energy. And if it's the case that the branch has zero net energy, then when you create other, each other branches, maybe they've got zero net energy. But the important thing is these different branches aren't supposed to interact with it, each other. So mm. even if if even if there was energy being created in the in the other branch, it wouldn't affect energy conservation in our branch because we're not interacting with it. But my my question, my answer to that question is very speculative about there being zero energy and not all physicists would say that. But it's a very interesting question. Thank you for that. OK, well, you know, go on to John Watt says an infinite number of copies of myself exist and experience every sort of alternative reality. This is the many worlds theory. Is that correct? I'm not sure. Does this sound crazy? It sounds crazy because it is, says Carlo Rovelli in Helgoland. Any comments? Yeah. Well, I have to say, first of all, the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics is only a minority interpretation. It's not as though most physicists adopt it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, that there are other interpretations of the collapse of the wave function. And, and, and of course, um, you, you just given an example of Ravelli, who, who, who takes a different view. The reason the multi, the reason the many worlds picture of Everett has become popular is because it sort of underlies the quantum cosmology approach of Hawking and his group. You remember I showed a picture where you have a superposition of universes starting out at the Big Bang. And the idea is that you quantum quantum cosmology allows you to have a superposition of universes. And, but then we, we go into one of them. 
um, when the universe um, you know, becomes classical. So that, that, in, that does require the many worlds picture. And that's why some people take it seriously. Now, mm -hmm. this business about, I mean, clearly um, your question asked the question of he didn't like the idea of, of an infinity mm -hmm. number of themselves, I agree. Um, and uh, or even millions, it doesn't have to be infinity. It's a, clearly a very uneconomic theory, and, and that's why a lot of people don't like it. I mean, you could say the same with the multiverse, but bearing in mind the many worlds, Everett's many worlds is just one version of the multiverse, but you could you could extend that criticism to all the multiverse scenarios because they're requiring many universes, which is also uneconomical, it could be argued. Um, all I would say is that, first of all, it doesn't literally require an infinity of universe. And personally, I don't like infinity because I don't think infinity ever arises in any real physics. It's a mathematical idealization. You just need enough universes um, in order for, for life to arise through a selection effect. So if there's a one in a million probability of life arising, given the constants, you, you need to have a million of them. But I, I'm not pushing for a million. Uh, for an infinity of universes at all. So I, maybe that the questioner's mind will be put a little bit at rest by that. Um, but uh, I, I, I agree, it, it, it might seem in both the context of the multiverse and in the context of um, the many worlds, it, it, it might seem rather, it certainly sounds counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but bear in mind, most ideas in, in these theories do sound counterintuitive. I mean, the idea of having 11 dimensions uh, might repel people just as much as the idea of having lots of versions. I have to say the other point about that is that even in the context of the first level of the multiverse, which is the different Hubble's, the Hubble regions when you go beyond the horizon, and that's uncontroversial. One of the arguments made by Tegmark is that if the universe really is infinite, then probabilistically there are bound to be I will say me rather than the questioner, they're bound to be other planets like the planet Earth, and they're bound to be people like me giving lectures like this, because with an infinite number of universes, well, however low the probability, there's going to be, a, they're bound to be other me's, maybe even an infinite number of me's, um, even giving these lectures. The only difference is that the next moment something happens, Dif something different happens. So in the other universe, one of my B me stops at this point. In this universe, I carry on a bit longer. So, mm -hmm. I mean, but to me, uh, that sounds crazy too, um, even though that level multiverse makes sense. I think the, what the message I get from this is avoid infinities. I don't like infinite universes. I personally prefer a universe which is closed and finite, so you don't get these infinities. So I share your questioner's um, antipathy towards infinity. But I, but I like to have a few universes. Well, um, Richard asks whether parallel universes is, is uh, the idea of parallel universe does seem messy. One of the views of a multiverse. I think you've probably uh, explained your views on, on that and have to what, anything extra to say on parallel universes. Well, only, only to stress that it is, it is level three multiverse which mm. I regard as, you remember, as I went down, they were becoming more yeah. and more controversial. So I regard that as, as very contentious, and one just has to accept that it isn't. It's a minority view among physicists uh, as an interpretation of the collapse of the wave function. So w whether you call it messy, I mean, yeah, well, that's a, a, a the equation, the mathematics is quite complicated in all of these theories. <laughs> So. Yeah. Well, I'm just jumping to Stephen King, who says, asks, is time in multiverse theories reversible? Any reason why multiverses can't recombine? That's interesting. Well, that's this is a that's a very deep question because that all relates to the nature of time, and it all relates to the arrow of time, and there are different sorts of time that arise, and. It, it, you know, in, in physics, in most of the equations of physics, you can reverse the direction of time. So you can have a universe expanding and you can have a universe uh, recollapsing. Uh, and so, but I actually, so in, in principle, you can have multiverse, you could have universes going backwards in time because the equations allow, you know, time reversibility. But we know there is a directionality of time and that's meant to be associated with the <laughs> second law of thermodynamics, it's meant to be associated with the fact that the universe started in a very special configuration, a special low entropy configuration. So then the question is, when you talk about the unit, the multiverse, 
I mean, are, are you going to apply the same concepts? Presumably, if you've got many big bangs, are you going to assume all these big bangs start off in the same low entropy with the same arrow of time? And you could certainly envisage other models, I mean, you, in which the universe doesn't start out with such a low entry big bang. So you could certainly have models where the direction of time is different. But in a funny way, I suspect your question is talking about a deeper issue, and that's to do when we talk about time, we're talking about very often the time of consciousness, our, our own flow of time from past to present to future. And that's something which isn't described by uh, standard physics at all, because physics doesn't talk about conscious flow of time. Uh, in Einstein's theory of relativity, there is no passage of time because past, present and future coexist. Even in quantum theory, the nature of the passage of time is, is ambiguous. I do think there is a deep link between the experience of the passage of time, in other words, consciousness, and the multiverse. I think it's, it comes in, um, you know, it relates to the higher dimensions, but that isn't the mainstream view, it's my own particular view. So I, you know, people sometimes say, well, is there a, I've talked about whether the anthropic fine tunings are actually to do with the observer, but the question is, are they really to do with consciousness? I mean, and if it's consciousness, what counts as an ob ob observer? What is the fine tuning for? Do you have to be a professor of mathematics or, or would, would a mouse count or would a computer count? What is the fine tuning for? And that's the really big question. Mm -hmm. I've said that to me, really, the fine tuning is for complexity. That's because then you avoid it and you know, you can then just regard brains as the culmination of complexity. But deep down, my personal view going beyond physics is that actually, I think consciousness is fundamental. And it is something to do with the universe being tuned for consciousness, not human consciousness, but but consciousness in some sense. And then that brings in the question, well, what is a crucial feature of question, a feature of consciousness? It's the nature of the passage of time. And I think that has something to do with the higher dimensions. So I do think there is a link between time and the multiverse, but it's it's not quite normal physical time. It's that higher level of time associated with consciousness, which I think will one day be part of physics. Well, thank you very much for that. There is one final question, which is probably something which uh, you might wish to email us on, and then we could uh, pass it round to um, participants. Uh, but it, Steve Roderick says, is it possible to provide references to the books and publications mentioned by yourself during his excellent presentation? So maybe you could let us have a. Yes, I mean, the, I mean, there are lots of actually there are lots of books. I mean, I I mean, I could um, I I could even in principle show some of the books in my t talk because I mean there are lot. Here's a book, for example, Martin Gardner, Universe. These are popular books. Um, there's um, sorry about this. Sorry about this. There's another book here, uh, the Cosmic Landscape. Uh, Martin Rees, Our Cosmic Habitat. Leonard Susskind, The Cosmic Landscape, Alex Valenkin, Many Worlds in One. There are quite a lot of books on the subject. Um, mm. A recent book is one on the fine tunings, which has just come out. But I mean, I, I can I can give you an email with all these references. And of course, these are books. There are lots of popular, um, there are lots of technical articles on the subject as well. So I think the best thing is that I give you, um, in, send an email to you, Marcus, for you to yes. pass on. I mean, obviously, the book I mainly plug was my own book because I'm. Well, I'm surprise, just, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, we've come. We've just overrun our, our time a little bit, and and there are still thirty one people uh, listening and 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 watching. So it remains for me only to thank you once again for a fascinating talk. Um, which, you know, will reverberate in lots of our minds for quite a while. Um, and, uh, yeah, and uh, that, that's really something we will treasure. And I hope uh, I converted you maybe a little bit, Marcus. I think you have, actually. I think you have. I need to think about it a bit more. But... <laughs> <laughs> By all means. <laughs> <laughs> maybe well, when then... I, if I speak again in another 10 years, the, the picture will be even clearer. Absolutely. We'll, we'll hold you to that. <laughs>
All right. Well, um, just message to the friends. Thank you. Thank you, for Professor Carr, again. Um, so we shall be holding two more talks before the end of the year. Um, the details of the next one on the 14th of October, which is about the magnetic universe, are on the website. And note, please, that this will be at 6 p.m. in the evening, not lunchtime. This is because our speaker is speaking from British Columbia. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining. We had well over 30 participants, and that, that's very good, and um, an excellent time certainly was held had by me, and I hope by everyone watching. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.